Welcome to the show today. Dayton Duncan is the author of many books about the American experience from the Lewis and Clark expedition and the national parks to the Dust Bowl. He's best known, however, as a writer and producer of documentary films in his partnership with Ken Burns, films that have shown on PBS for many years. Dayton Duncan, uh, welcome to the show. It is a pleasure to have you here. I want to start out talking to you about you as a writer. Uh, you're a famous producer guy, <laughs> and people who pay attention see that you're a very active writer on all these shows. But it's, I, I think you actually started out as a writer. That's really the thread through your whole career, isn't it? Yeah, I consider myself first and foremost a journalist, a writer uh, journalist. I have started in a small newspaper in New Hampshire uh, covering uh, school boards and bond hearings and uh, hmm. uh, graduated to write, covering politics. I used to write a smart aleck column that appeared once a week in uh, 17 papers in northern New England. Um, so you got, your, you got your chops as a writer with that daily discipline of having to train out Yeah, copy. and that was a, it was a terrific training as a writer. I, I, I had not had an ambition of being a writer when I was a, you know, a kid and even in college. Uh, but it was, I learned when I got this job on a newspaper what I loved doing, which is the going out and finding out information and coming back and struggling to try to put it into some sort of sense that, you know, uh, got the information across clearly, uh, hopefully with some spice and uh, uh, compellingness. Uh, I loved, I have to admit, seeing my name, mm -hmm. you know, as a byline, particularly if it was on the front page, like every newspaper reporter uh, feels. Uh, but it taught me a lot of skills. Meeting deadlines uh, taught me the skill of organizing information. Uh, it taught me the skill of sifting information, what's important, what's not, of interviewing people. Um, you know, I and think I, I loved it. I couldn't believe that I was getting paid to go out and do that. I think it's really interesting the way you came at, uh, to being a writer, and it seems like that transition into writing for a really large audience, which you do now with the shows, that was never really a problem. That's the way you thought about writing uh, all the time. And sometimes that is a stumbling block for writers to right. make that move out to a larger audience. Yeah, I mean, I'm not writing in some sort of personal, revelatory, uh, you know, artistic sense. I, I hope that some of the th things that I write have, you know, a little poetry mixed in with the prose and that it gets to deeper things than just the surface of, uh, of oh, facts. I love your but, scripts. But, it's, uh, but I, that's where I come from, is yeah. trying to get information that I think is important or entertaining or interesting, hopefully maybe all three sometimes, uh, across to uh, an everyday audience. And, uh, you know, film is a different way of doing that. In fact, some of the things you ended up working on as a filmmaker started out as writing projects. I mean, you were interested in Lewis and Clark yeah. long before Lewis and Clark, the PBS show, right? Absolutely. Uh, Lewis and Clark is, uh, you know, now part of my bloodstream for almost a quarter century. I went out and retraced the Lewis and Clark Trail for a magazine piece for the Boston Globe Sunday Magazine in 1983. And then I got asked by a publisher to turn it into a book. And I said, well, if I'm going to make a book out of it, I'm sorry, I have to go back out and do this whole, whole journey one more time to get more information, which I did. And then that became my first book, Out West. Haven't you uh, done that four times, though? Retrace. Well, their... I've retraced the the route four different, you know, four different times from St. Louis to the coast and back. And since my first journey out and back in 1983, not a year has passed since then that at least some part of each year I haven't gone to some uh, part of the trail. So I suffer from Lewis and Clark itis, which is an infectious disease, and I'm in the final terminal stage of it. You know, I'm so fascinated with your doing the Lewis and Clark expedition route four times. Were you traveling the way they traveled? I mean, were you in canoes and boats and, or whatever? I was trying to replicate their journey in the spirit that they undertook it. Thomas Jefferson sent them out mm -hmm. to say, travel the course of the Missouri River over what he hoped would be a Northwest Passage and finally reach the, the end of the continent and come back and tell me and the nation what it is that you found. And this is right that, after the Louisiana Purchase, so there's all right. that excitement about that new right. territory. Actually, he had planned it before he even uh, 
uh, completed the Louisiana Purchase. So by the time they left, they were now traveling through newly acquired, quote, American land, uh, at least till they got to the Rocky Mountains. But m I, f I was just trying to replicate the spirit of that. So I didn't feel I had to replicate, I didn't have to get a keel boat and, and pull it against the current of the Missouri River. They, uh, first of all, <laughs> took them two and a half years and for my magazine story I had a month and a half. So I had to cover more ground more quickly. But in certain places I would get out on the river in a canoe or I went out on big uh, tugboats, I went out on uh, you know boats at the mouth of the Columbia River that uh, you know, crab boats and things like that. I went by horseback in certain parts. I hiked per, per portions of it, but I, I wasn't trying to say this, uh, I'm, I wasn't trying to replicate yeah. the, that part of the experience. My job was then to look at what I found on that same journey, the people that I met, the experiences that I had, and to the extent that they were very different than Lewis and Clark's almost 200 years earlier, then I had a th third job, not only recounting mm -hmm. my experiences and not only recounting theirs, but somehow to come to grips with the history, American history of the West between their journey and mine. So it you was know, part I, history and part journalism. I think your viewers really pick up that there's something uh, central in, in your work and your work with Ken Burns about the Lewis and Clark uh, film. And I, I think, if I, I, I think I'm probably right about this, I think you've made it with your success with that film, central in a way for the rest of us that it didn't used to be. You know, uh -huh. Lewis and Clark has kind of moved to the center. This came out in 1997. It, right. we, do you see it as a kind of anchor work in what you all have well, done? Well, uh, you know, I can't speak for Ken, who's, yeah. who had done uh, a number of films before he and I started more officially working together. Uh, but it was, uh, it was an important film for me because it's an important story to me because of the way that I see it, not only in my own life, uh, as sort of the start for me as a writer who wrote, writes books versus uh, sure. just a journalist, but I think see it as this really important and symbolic moment for us as a, a nation. In other words, they were sent by this nation which previously had been bounded by the Mississippi River and the Atlantic Ocean, the potentially the Brazil of North America, mm -hmm. which instead became a continental nation. And they are the first representatives of our nation to go and see all of that and come back and report on it uh, before the nation itself moved along that same track and changed everything in its path. So they're at this hinge moment of history where they're seeing the, the West before the United States followed them and and changed it, and there's so a, it's just at that moment that I find fascinating. Well, and you you dramatize it so well. There's a moment in, in the film where you say that this isn't like going to the moon or going into outer space. We do that. We kind of know where we're going. Right. They were stepping off into space because they had right. really no idea of where they were going. So the drama of that's pretty pretty intense. Yeah, and we tried to make sure that in our story, in our style of storytelling, uh, we don't try to gin up false drama or suspense or anything, but we do try to make sure that you are with them and understand that uh, every school kid in America knows, if they know anything about Lewis and Clark, the one thing they know is that they succeeded, that they got out there and back, which is uh, something that Lewis and Clark didn't know right. when they left St. Louis. They didn't find a Northwest and, Passage, and but it they, wasn't there. And they didn't know that they were going to succeed. And right. when their first... Uh, member dies of a burst appendix only several months out, uh, they didn't know, as historians know and will write the story when they write, the, write, write it when they write history, is saying that was the only casualty. Well, the people burying Sergeant Charles Floyd in August of 1804 didn't walk away from that burial ceremony saying, boy, I'm glad that the... This is the only casualty. Thank, thank God the only casualty is now behind us. They were thinking, how many of these are we going to have? And is one of them going to be my funeral? But it's and so we wanted, to keep, we wanted to keep, in our style of storytelling, is historical, but it also attempts to try to put you in that place, you know, to suspend your knowledge that, that's all going to turn out okay. Yeah. Uh, and and put you in, in that moment of history because that is sort of the... I don't know, the subtle uh, lesson in all of our 
uh, films and in all the things that I believe in, in my writing about history, which is that history is made by everyday people who are just doing the best that they can, not knowing exactly how it's all going to turn out. And I learned this in my times in politics. You know, you make choices and it leads things to something else happens and something else happens. Sometimes that turns out to be good, sometimes not. But it is, that's what history is. When we look back on it, we think, well, it's obviously going to be turning out this way and turning out this way. At that moment, you don't know that that's the way that's going to be. And if, uh, if we are, if we can understand history that way, it not only becomes more, I think, accessible and dramatic and exciting, but it also teaches us that we are in the midst of making history. Now, it's not to say that people are going to be making documentary <coughs> films about you or me later on, but we are the same, and we're making choices. Actually, I think they and, are. And, There's a true crew over here <laughs> today. Yeah, this is the beginning of it. But um, you know, one of the but, things. But you, that's what history is. One of the things you succeed at so well, and it's been absolutely haunting for me, is a sense of uh, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark as sort of characters in history. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about them a little bit? I, I mean, I've. I have thought about them constantly yeah. since I saw, the, I've, I've ne it's never gone out of my mind since I saw your film. There's such a strong sense of what they were like as a team. You call right. them the best team ever right. and what they were like as individuals. Well, this is going to sound a little weird, but Meriwether Lewis and William Clark are good friends of mine. I mean, I, I, uh, uh, I don't mean it to sound, you know, too uh, whatever, uh, but uh, I've gotten to know them through reading their journals. You know, one of the great glories of American history and literature are the journals of Lewis and Clark and a couple mm -hmm. of the sergeants and one private, which left to us this incredible description of them seeing these places and these parts of America that know American citizens. Now, it's, it's a 40-person 40, 40 team yeah. and Lewis and Clark, right? Yeah, roughly. Yeah. I mean, it changed sizes from, from, from different. And these were the two captains who, uh, breaking all military protocol, Meriwether Lewis as the captain of the expedition, sent by, per, personally chosen by President Jefferson, decided that he needed to have a co-captain and chose William Clark, who was a little bit older, had once been his commanding officer, but offered him the job of going and helping him lead it and promising him that he would be share equally in the decision making and everything else. That's against all military protocol. And yet I think when you start to get to know these people, uh, Lewis understood, I think, that there are parts of him that was, were not entirely up to the task. He's a pretty young guy, what, 30 years old? He was, uh, yeah, uh, about to be 30 yeah. when, when they started off in his 20s and, uh, and Clark was in his early 30s. But they made this team that each of them complemented the other person and they uh, established over the two and a half years they're together not only a team but a friendship, a bond that is... Um, you know, just wonderful thing to behold in its in, in its own right. And each of them say, Clark is the guy who made sure that everything got done. He's the one you could really rely the on. The steady yeah. rudder, you know, on the boat. Uh, Lewis was a little more mercurial, a little more of uh, uh, a little more ethereal. And sometimes I believe it's you know people can get into disputes over trying to psychoanalyze a guy who's been dead for two hundred years. And I try not to do that, but seemingly capable of withdrawing into himself, which you know, signs of you know what we would now think of as depression, bipolar, and, yeah, and, and not <clears throat> keeping a journal, though he had been, you know, uh, that was one of the prime orders mm -hmm. of President Jefferson, and then suddenly start writing again. And you know, if if you're sort of attuned to those kind of things, and if you've known people like that, you can sort of read that into him. You don't want to probably o overdo it, but uh, without Clark, do, he wouldn't have made it. And, and, and Lewis doesn't do well after the expedition, does he? No, he fell pretty, I, I would say, pretty much fell apart. Yeah. Um, he didn't get the uh, journals turned into the book that he had promised the nation. Uh, he was, part of it was because he was made, part of his reward was to be made uh, governor of the new Louisiana Territory. And he's just not cut out for that kind of office job and all those responsibilities. He got into money problems. He drank too much. He 
uh, may have gotten malaria and be taking drugs uh, for that that uh, you know exacerbated whatever his uh, other conditions would have been and ended up committing suicide uh, about three years after the expedition. Whereas Clark has a wonderful career after the expedition. Right? Clark was made by the expedition. I mean, he, he came from a very prominent family of, of, uh, of explorers, American explorers, and of uh, military men. Uh, and he was the youngest uh, in that family, but he, uh, by being part of the Lewis and Clark expedition, uh, became the, the uh, Indian agent for the Louisiana Territory, the first appointed governor of the Missouri Territory, you know, had a family, had children, first son was named Meriwether Lewis Clark, that tells you something about the, that friendship. Uh, and they went, you know, they went in different ways that way. But they, they were a team uh, uh, of brothers that uh, without one of which, you know, needed the other, and each of them added to the something that was better than the whole. It seems like there's a, a kind of implicit mythology that makes a lot of sense to me in the way you present them in the expedition, that these are sort of prophets in the wilderness getting an advanced look at the grandeur, the expanse of the country, and one uh, prophet doesn't deal so well with that, the other right. go, goes to work afterwards. Uh, it, it sort of makes sense to me that way, you know, that, that uh, Lewis goes crazy and has a bad time because yeah. it was just too much for him. Yeah, I don't know if I go quite that far about okay. that he goes that he goes crazy, but they you know they both brought to it different personalities. And part of what they were doing is they were experiencing a landscape that is part of uh, of this great nation. The part of who we are as a people is this incredible continent that we inhabit. Uh, it has so many different parts, and they came across parts of it that in their wildest imaginations they could not have anticipated bison herds of 10,000. They, they, they saw species of animals that no one had ever heard of, as they would say, back in the states, yeah, yeah. right? Which just meant east of the, of the Mississippi River, ranging from prairie dogs to grizzly bears. They could have n had no conception of the expanse of the Great Plains. <clears throat> the mountains that they came to were much bigger and much more you know, uh, tangled than they could ever have imagined. And secondly, the web of native peoples who they encountered and uh, upon whom they relied many times for directions, food, shelter, uh, had their own uh, cultures and their own things in ways that they, you know, that they weren't quite ready to understand. They thought they could just come in and say, you've got a new great father, he lives for the sun rises, you are to trade only with us and they'd heard this story from French traders and Spanish traders and British traders in some, certain portions. Certain portions had never seen white men before and they had trouble I think contending with the complexities of the native world that it wasn't monolithic. Each tribe had its own needs and its own desires and its own jealousies uh, with, with other tribes and, and it was naive they were starting to finally understand how naive it probably was to think that they could just sort of impose an American, you know, peace on the Great Plains that would advantage the United States and serve their trade I, relations. I think you're suggesting, and this was my sense watching that film, is that the American experience is there in a kind of embryonic form, in a yeah. nutshell, and the encounter with native peoples and the uh, the democracy right. that comes up and the way they uh, decide what to do on the expedition etc really looks ahead to the national experience yeah it's both a, it's it, yeah it's both a seed of a future and it also suggests things that uh, a, a, of alternative ways that history right. could have gone they with with very few exceptions got along wonderfully well with the native tribes that they met now part of that is that they're they're in the position of little bit outnumbered. Mm -hmm. They're not a big position to sort of bully people Boss around. People around yeah. But nonetheless, they f they finally established uh, over time uh, relationships with most of the tribes that they met that we did not replicate. Yeah. And so if it has within it the sense of a missed moment of American history. What if we had done it more like that? Right. Wouldn't our history be a little have a little less tragedy and sadness uh, within it. And you sort of wish that it could have been that way. And then at the same time, 
implicit in what they're doing is this. You can feel this almost inevitable thing coming that's going to be coming behind it. And there's a sadness, a bittersweet sadness uh, in that. And yet also it's this wide-eyed look at the continent and the bounty that became the thing that, you know, that attracted people westward you know, well, for the rest of that century. It sounds like you're starting to talk about uh, <laughs> what I think, think of as just the really great work that you've done, 2009, the National Parks. Uh, wow, what an epic drama. Uh, yeah. you, you, you deal with 53 of the 58 national parks, right? Well, we filmed in 53 of the 58 national parks. We have images of all 58. We don't tell the story of every single park. The concept for national parks was to look at, make us as a, or not make us, but encourage us as uh, Americans to look at our national parks a little differently than we do. We take it for granted that they are, exist, that they're protected for us to go see. And that's the farthest from the historical truth. All of human history up until we decided as a nation to start preserving our most majestic places as parks in perpetuity for everyone, up until that time, all of those kind of places were the exclusive preserve mm -hmm. of the king and royalty, the richest people, the most privileged mm -hmm. and insiders. So when we decided that we were going to do it differently, that was a radical decision. Original idea. Really. And original to yeah. us as yeah. a, you know, and as we say in the film, as uniquely American as the Declaration of Independence and just as radical. So we wanted to look at those, how did that happen? Who are the people behind it? And what you find is the story of every single national park when you turn that rock over is not the self-evident thought that it was going to become protected and preserved for future Americans, but, but a struggle that was started by one person, two people, three people, group of people, several groups of people who said, we love this place. We are transformed in our experiences by seeing it and experiencing it. And we want people forever to have that same chance that we did. Mm -hmm. You know, generations that we'll never know, yeah. Yeah. we want them the chance to fall in love with the two. And, they, you know, and there were long, you know, struggles to finally get the government, you know, in park after park after park to set it aside. You know, whether it's the Grand Canyon, there was, you know, from the time that it was first proposed as a national park in 1882, until 1919, mm -hmm. it took that long to finally get a law that said, we're going to save this place forever and for everyone. Uh, that tells you, if, the, if it takes that long to do the Grand Canyon, my goodness, uh, <laughs> that tells you a little bit about the forces and the struggles that are involved. It seemed to me there were two uh, major notes that really stuck out to me. One, I think you're already talking about, uh, the national parks as an icon of, the, of national identity, right. national experience. The other one, we, you and I were talking about this a little bit earlier, is that a sense of sort of religiosity. There, there are moments where uh, a ranger, Shelton Johnson, is uh -huh. talking about delivering mail and coming into a uh, snow-covered area and he sees a bison buffalo and, and it, it, what could be just a beautiful scene really turned into something like a religious epiphany. Right. And that comes up again and again that there's a kind of spirit and a kind of religiosity, a deeper, deep sense of who we are as Americans that may be only available through the National Park experience. Yeah, I, 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 there's, that's, that, that's true historically and, and, and now. It's always been true of our experience in these very special places. I don't think it's only available there. I think it's just it, it is just the, the door opens so much, you know, broader. It's so powerful and, there. And it's so powerful yeah. there that it connects you to things that are larger than yourself, that have been there forever or that uh, uh, that uh, are timeless. And you feel, as John Muir said, that when you try to pick out anything by itself, you find it hitched to everything else in the universe. In other words, you feel this transcendent connection to the natural world mm -hmm. that in our everyday lives, particularly the more you get closer to modern times, that we are increasingly separated from. But it's just unavoidable there. And so when Shelton Johnson talks about stopping his snowmobile as he's delivering mail in winter in Yellowstone and sees this bison herd, and he said, uh, 
I started looking at that and thinking, this is the first dawn, and these shadows that I'm seeing are the first shadows yeah. that have ever been been cast, and they're breathing, and I'm breathing, and we're all in, in unison. He was you know, saying exactly the same thing that John Muir had felt a hundred years earlier when he wrote, as, as we open our film, one learns that the world, though made, is yet being made, that this is still the morning of creation. In other words, we are witness to something eternal. That's a religious vision, and getting that back is, to an origin. That, yeah. is, that is religious, and, but it, that, it doesn't have to be naturally, necessarily organized religiously. No, no. It's spiritual and religious, uh, and things that, uh, t uh, that Emerson wrote about, as the transcendentalists wrote about and felt, that in nature is where, rather than cathedrals that we built, in the cathedral of nature, is where we, if we let ourselves be transparent to it, the transparent eyeball as uh, a spirituality say, that's if you uh, open yourself to it, you uh, the, you will transcend your moment and your own bounds of 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 your time and your life, and you are part of something that is eternal. And I think that that's very much the case in national parks. And additionally to it, uh, it is also uh, in the sense this is something that we pass on to our next generation. Yeah. If I'm standing at the, as I have, at Jenny Lake in the Grand Tetons with my children, I am both the nine-year-old boy uh, who stood there with his mother, yeah. who considered it the most beautiful sight she ever saw, yeah. and I'm also the father of my two children yeah. holding their hand, and knowing, hoping, yeah, that someday they'll be doing it. So I'm. It's a time is compressing moments. and expanding at yeah. the same point on a personal level, which is you yeah. know, you can call it religious, you can call it whatever, but you can feel that uh, if you're lucky enough to have had an intergenerational, because so much else in our world changes all the time. I know you. Know, and a park is a place where you can go back and you can stand there and know that what you're seeing, this is what John Muir saw, or this is what the Hopi Indians ha you know, were experiencing, and this is what you know, generations upon ha uh, have seen, and extend yourself to say, and long after I'm gone, if we do it right, other people can stand here and feel the same sense of transcendence and openness and a connection to some, that makes us both much smaller because it, we're, you know, you're facing the, the immensity. infinity and the yeah. immensity of, of the natural world, and yet larger because you are expanding to, uh, to, to fill that space uh, within your spirit. And you know, uh, that's what parks do. They rearrange your molecules a little bit. Well, that is a beautiful vision, and you convey it so powerfully. As you do here, you, oh. you can pay it, convey it powerfully here, but very, very powerfully in the film. So, yeah. uh, I got a lot of good footage. You know, it's better to to see it. And as much as we think uh, our that our film helps to capture that spirit and to capture the sense of the place, what we also had hoped to do, and it turned out to to you know, to happen. And we are very both Ken and I. One of the greatest thrills of our lives was both the fact that. What we were hoping that people, lots of people would watch it and that what they would say is, I got to get in my car or I got to go happening. to those place and, and take, if, I, if I'm a parent, take my kids so they can experience that too. And, and that happened and uh, the National Park Service bestowed on both of us uh, the great honor, I, th I think, of being honorary park rangers. I'm sorry I didn't bring my hat with me. <laughs> Then, uh, okay, we are out of time. Uh, I wish we had a couple more hours. Thank you for this. It's really been a very special show. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you for being with us today. We hope that you'll join us next time. Thank you for watching.